All right, perfect timing for the tune. Uh, I think we can start. Uh, welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have a colleague uh, from ours, Dr. Johannes Betz, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's working in the X Lab <coughs> for safe autonomous systems. Also, Johannes will uh, uh, join uh, TUM uh, as an assistant professor in, uh, next January. So something about Johannes, uh, it does a lot of things. I'll try to summarize them uh, in a few words. Uh, Johan, after earning his Bachelor of, of Engineering and Master of Science in Automotive Engineering, he, he worked on his PhD at Technical University of Munich, uh, where he also was then a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of uh, Automotive Technology. And there he founded the TUM Aut Autonomous Motorsport team, from which we will see, I guess, a lot of cool things today. In general, his research focuses on holistic <clears throat> software development for autonomous systems, especially in extreme motions at the dynamic limits uh, in extreme and unknown environments. Uh, he uses modern algorithms from artificial intelligence and is trying to develop a new and advanced methods for, uh, for, intel for these kind of things, systems. Also, a fun fact is that he has a Master of Arts in Philosophy that he actively employs uh, when developing new path and behavior planners for autonomous systems that have to take into account ethical theories. Uh, today, he's going to talk about learning to handle autonomous vehicles at the limit, uh, bringing in experiences from the RoboRace and the India Autonomous Challenge. Uh, it is obvious that this topic is very important for, for the audience of this seminar, and therefore I'm very excited and I, I leave the stage to you, Johannes. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today um, and give you a detailed uh, overview of my experiences from developing an autonomous race car. So in the next uh, 40 to 50 minutes, I would like to go over three big questions. Um, the first question is like autonomous racing, is it autonomy on the edge? And the second one will be how can we develop software for an autonomous race car? And the third one will be how do we improve software for an autonomous race car? And along this talk, I hope that I can answer these questions for you, but maybe in a discussion in the end, we can try to answer these questions even more, because I think you will have a lot of questions in the end. So let's start with the first section, autonomous racing, autonomy on the edge. Um, I'm not sure who of you is um, watching Formula One. So I'm a big Formula One fan and I'm watching Formula One since over 25 years. And every time I watch Formula One, I get um, the impression that there are three very important things. And that makes the racing aspect very, very interesting. The first one you see in the left view is called detecting the vehicle limits. You see the car here driving in the rain. It's nothing unusual, but every time a race car, a Formula One team comes to a new track, the track looks different. The car looks different because we have a different vehicle setup. We have different tracks, different constructions, uh, conditions in an unstructured environment. And last but not least, when the car is driving, it's losing grip because of tire wear and it's losing mass because of fuel consumption in a two hour window. This is something we do not have with a normal passenger vehicle. And every time that happens, we need to detect the exact vehicle limits because they change over time. In the second video in the middle, you see one of my favorite videos of all time. This is an overtaking maneuver at Spa Francochor. It's a racetrack in Belgium. And you see that the car here is doing this overtake maneuver in this left right turn at 270 kilometers an hour. So it's a very bold move because the car that does the overtake maneuver needs to predict what is the other car in front of it doing. Um, is it moving to the left? Is it moving to the right? Does it give me enough space in this turn? And can I move ultimately to the right side again? This implies that the race driver needs to do or deal with some strategy decisions, some energy constraints, because afterwards there's like a long straight coming and needs to do the overtaking maneuver at high speeds in the end. And number three, 
Um, on the right side, this is Michael Schumacher driving in Monaco. Monaco is also a very special racetrack because you see um, there's walls right next to the car, right next to the racetrack, which means one mistake and he's crashing into the wall directly. And you see him slightly drifting in this left right turn. So racing implies handling at the vehicle limits, high speeds, high accelerations. We need a high planning horizon in the end and only have small reaction time. So now everything you see here, you combine it and say, let's do that autonomously. And that's creating for us the field of autonomous racing. That's the things we have to deal with. So the community of autonomous racing grew in the last 10 years. For me, when I just look at the numbers dramatically, so over the last 10 years, we had 270 papers published in this field with increasing numbers. The topic becomes more and more popular and more and more researchers try to use that kind of setup to develop software that goes beyond what we have seen so far. Most of the research here is located in the field of motion planning and control um, because the control aspect and the motion planning aspect is something we have seen right now. It's very, very difficult. We see less research in the field of perception, but also a growing field in end-to-end -end approaches like somebody is using a neural network, a whole pipeline, or some reinforcement learning algorithms. And when you look at the state of the art, you see a variety of cars out there. For example, on the left side, you see the drifting DeLorean from Stanford or the Audi TTRS that did the Pikes Peak autonomously from Stanford. You see here in the middle, very prominent, the EDH Zurich AMC driverless car who won multiple competitions, very successful team. You see on the right side, a small scale car, the F1 Times vehicle. You see above the Robo Race car from my um, team from TUM. You see the Indy Autonomous Challenge car. You see the Robo Race car in the right corner without the cockpit. Um, the small one, you see a lot of hardware is out there that researchers are using to, um, yeah, to showcase their uh, software they developed for an autonomous vehicle. One prominent example I want to go into the death today um, is the India Autonomous Challenge. There was a competition um, which was ongoing for two years, and the goal was to have a fully autonomous race. So Formula One, but completely autonomously. Uh, we had 30 universities worldwide that took part in the competition. And in the end, we had a $1 million first prize. Um, we had two races in the end. One was planned at the first, but two races in the end, one in Indianapolis and one in Las Vegas. And the one in Indianapolis was a completely single vehicle challenge. So we tried to figure out who has the fastest race car um, on the racetrack. So the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is an oval. Uh, it's a very easy um, racetrack, but with some banking inside, which makes it then a little bit more difficult. We had um, three cars going into the final competition, and we figured out which is the fastest car by average of uh, four laps. The second race we had, you can see in the picture below, that was an overtaking challenge. So we had two cars on the racetrack completely autonomously. They needed to take, overtake each other all the time. And then we increased the speed and we figured out which is the last car standing, which is the last car that can overtake. And then this car wins. So the third thing you see, and this helps us to, to answer our question a little bit, um, autonomy on the edge, yes, because we see cars driving at high speed, they do everything a race driver does, but we are not there yet that we have like a Formula One-like environment, like 20 cars on a racetrack, everybody's driving autonomously, everybody's driving at 300 kilometers an hour. This is something we do not have today, unfortunately, but we're getting there. The car um, we had um, is an Indy Lights vehicle. So this is an off-the-shelf vehicle. You can buy that. You can call um, the Lara and say, I want to get an Indy Lights vehicle, and you can buy it. It's a combustion engine vehicle with a six-gear transmission, so a very classical race car. You see uh, um, the spoiler application, which makes it like a formal car, but it was modified for us to um, achieve the autonomous behavior. So we have a differential GPS integrated, we have radars integrated, we have uh, three LIDARs integrated, and multiple cameras. 
ultimately our code runs on one high performance computer it's an Intel Xeon platform with an Nvidia Quattro RTX so what you see here is very very basic to um, a normal autonomous vehicle there's nothing special integrated which um, makes this car uh, a big difference for example to a autonomous car like from Waymo or from Cruise what you see today on the street but for example the Intel Xeon platform um, is not automotive great in this case it's a developer platform um, that helps us to run our algorithms a little bit faster than in comparison with some automotive great easy use um, with this, I want to try to answer the first question. And of course, it's um, based on my experience. But to summarize, um, what you just learned is autonomous racing is a branch of autonomous driving. And this field is conducted by international researchers. So all over the world, people are doing that. And it's always the goal to drive at high speeds and high accelerations on the racetrack, but especially in an adversarial multi-vehicle environment. So we saw a lot of single vehicle research in the beginning, but now everything is moving to multi-vehicle environments. We conduct this research in both simulation and real world, and ultimately we are taking part in international competitions. And as I showed the image before, we had this rubber race competition, we had the Indy Autonomous Challenge competition, we have F110s, but we have also Formula Student Driverless. So there are competitions all over the world where you as a student or as a researcher can take part in. And therefore, we answered the first question. Yes, it is autonomy on the edge, but there is still some development we need to do in this field to make it even more um better and spectacular so we uh, achieve a formula one like race one day that's it for um, my first section and i hope you got a good feeling now what autonomous racing is and we are on the same level of understanding because now we are going into the depth now i try to answer the question how can we develop software for an autonomous race car because now i think the question arises: what is the big difference to a normal car right to a normal autonomous driving car um can we use some off-the-shelf codes um do we need to develop something special so the first thing you normally do when you try to develop uh, an, an autonomous vehicle uh, or an autonomous system, you try to figure out your tools and the middleware. So based on my experience, and I'm doing that since the last five years, um, we relied always heavily on ROS middleware. In our case now for IndyCar, it was ROS2, because this is a backbone um, of middleware that helps us to exchange the information between software modules we have the possibility to use a modular software design so the big difference for example to some research you see you will see like in a minute is that we are not doing some end-to-end -end, um, approaches we are having a modular design where we're focusing on perception planning and control because we change these modules over the years right so what you see here is an improvement over years when new modules were development and therefore it's very important that we have a modularized and containerized version so in the end everything is put into a docker and you can exchange the docker very very quickly and see hey i have an approved for example perception algorithm and this runs even better so you can exchange them in our case, we are running a variety of code software. We have Python modules, especially for machine learning applications. Of course, we have these frameworks like PyTorch uh, or TensorFlow that helps us with that. We are running C++ for performance critical software. And we also use some MATLAB code generation for our control software. So what you see on the right side is something you probably do not have in an automotive grade uh, development in a company because it's a wide mix up and there everybody is focusing on performance critical components. But in our case, because we are researchers, we can have this variety of code snippets that um, then in the end achieve the module that runs uh, a specific software part. So here, my, my big learning is that you can choose from a variety of software um, and middleware that is online. The most important side for today is our software architecture for an autonomous race car. 
And this architecture evolved in the last five years, and this is the latest version we were using in the, in the autonomous challenge vehicle. So first of all, the access to sensors the vehicle is giving us. In our case, we are relying on all the sensors. There are like some teams that say, hey, I do not need, for example, the radar or the camera. That's fine. In our case, we are relying on all the sensors. Then we are doing a localization based on GPS and LiDAR. We are detecting the objects. Then in the next module, we are doing a prediction, um, object tracking and prediction of other vehicle behavior. Then we are moving to, for me, which is the heart of our software. Um, it's the planning part because here the local trajectory planning is conducted and also the vehicle performance, like the adaption of the vehicle, what we saw earlier to the track is done. And ultimately we control the vehicle. And in the India Autonomous Challenge vehicle, we had the tube MPC, which I will explain you in the end. So this is our framework for autonomous racing. And what you will see here when we go into detail now, that this is also something you find probably in a normal autonomous vehicle or online or in your lectures, but with some slightly changes, especially in the prediction and in the planning and in the control part. So you see that we need to adjust and um, adapt all these algorithms to make them work at high speeds and high acceleration. So what I want to do now with you is to go to all of these modules and show you some, some real data, um, some experimental data from, from our research so you get an idea how these algorithms work. Let's start in the beginning um, with the sensor preprocessing. And what I brought with you is the LiDAR preprocessing. So when you have a, a 3D LiDAR, you have a variety of points, like so-called point cloud, there a lot of points are not relevant for a driving task, right? Because we need the LiDAR for the object detection and the localization. That's what we need. So what we need to do is to pre-process the data and get rid of most of the data points. But in our case, because we are driving at 200, 300 kilometers an hour, this needs to be efficient and fast. So what we're doing, first of all, is a geometric and voxel filtering where we can reduce like 50% of the points. And now I jump through the pictures a little bit that you see the difference. So on the left side, you see here in this pictures that you have all the grandstands on the left side, and then we can remove that. In the next step, we are applying some ground filtering and can reduce even more, 10% more points. And what you see now is that we only have um, the walls left and the cars in front of us, which are like some big black dots. So this processing is very important because in the end, everything comes down to how fast can I run the code? How fast can I run the whole pipeline? Because this determines how fast I can rent the car. Okay, now we had done some pre-processing with the LiDAR, we have reduced data points, now we're moving into the localization. In our case, in all the cars I have used, we are having the access to differential GPS. The differential GPS is super accurate, it gives us an accuracy of two to three centimeters, so this helps us absolutely to localize the vehicle and it's necessary, but and this GPS drops out sometimes. So even have, if you have the accuracy, you cannot rely on GPS only. So you need to create a pipeline. Um, that's what we did over the last years. Um, that is like a, a backup pipeline for state estimation in our car. So what we are doing is fusing the IMU data, fusing even the LiDAR data for some boundary detection and the track layout we knew before, do some um, coordinate transformation and fuse everything together in a Kalman filter. This Kalman filter, of course, was heavily tuned and adapted for this use case. So it runs on these high speed, run on these high accelerations. And in the end, we can have a reliable localization. What you see here now, or what I wanted to say here is that even we have this high precise localization, and even if we have the dropouts, the localization determines in the end how fast, uh, no, how accurate the car is driving, of course. But in our case, 
in in particular uh, in in comparison to a normal autonomous vehicle um if we are five centimeters to the left that means that we are probably crashing into the wall so the localization even if it's not the focus of today or even of my research is so important that it determines if the car is crashing into the wall or not in the end so now we know um, what is our approach to localize the vehicle. In the next step, we are trying to do some object detections. And this is something which is quite similar to the state of the art, because here we did not do any super new developments. We are relying heavily on state of the art algorithms. This has two reasons. First of all, um, we and my team, we are not perception researchers uh, or computer vision uh, engineers. That's fine. But also that the off-the-shelf algorithms we have right now in the community are very, very good. So you can download um, code online and computer vision algorithms that have such a high performance there was no need for us right now to redevelop something or to come up uh, with some new ideas. So we are relying here heavily on a point RCNN pipeline that is our primary pipeline for close range detection. The point RCNN, and I just show a video here on the left side, how you can see that, is creating for us a 3D detection. So we're not doing 2D de uh, detection, we are doing 3D detection. And this is based on PointNet open source algorithm. I just replay that again. Um, it's a two-stage detector, which means um, on deep neural network, we need to use labor training data from the, from the vehicles. But in the end, we get 100 milliseconds inference time, which is quite fast for us um, to do the object detection. So this is what we are relying mostly on to create uh, the objects, the 3D objects on the racetrack. And then in a second pipeline, we're doing clustering algorithm, which is our LiDAR safety pipeline. So we are running a cluster algorithm on the point clouds. We are removing all the outliers and then in the end um, do an additional detection and fuse that together. In a second step, we are using radar information. Um, the radar is giving us an object list directly, so we do not need to do anything uh, special here. And in the end, we are using the camera uh, for a secondary pipeline uh, where we do a monocular known height um, adaption and then use the YOLO algorithms to detect the cars. So this is um, also an example from the YOLO detection. So YOLO is also like an off-the-shelf algorithm, is pre-trained for vehicles already. Um, is giving you the distance of the vehicles, um, is giving you the whole boundary box of the vehicles, so everything you need. And the only thing we need to do is lift that to uh, 3D, and we can do that with a known height estimation. We, like, we know the height of the other cars, so we can lift that from 2D to 3D. In the end, we fuse everything together and do an object fusion and tracking. So first of all, we do a transformation from local to global coordinate system. In the second step, we do some plausibility checks, merge everything together. We use the object matching, the Hungarian method, an optimization algorithm that does the allocation for us. We do a state estimation and then a delay compensation. And ultimately, we have a unified object list. So this is our pipeline. Uh, for object detection. And again, this is something um, which is coming from off-the-shelf algorithms. Of course, it has our flavor and our mechanisms and our ideas of combining these three together. But basically what you see here, this is our pipeline to get a reliable object detection at high speeds and high accelerations. I can just repeat that again. This is our pipeline and we're not coming from the field of computer vision. So what I figured out is that we have currently no particular developments for high speed and high acceleration algorithms. So I think there's like a big need for these algorithms in the future. So if somebody, if you is interested in figuring out, hey, how can I drive at 300 kilometers and higher, uh, with just camera object detection, for example, I think this is an interesting research field. Okay, now we have our uh, objects 
detected. And now we know where we are. So the next step in our pipeline is we need to predict what the other vehicles are doing. So prediction is um, something a lot of researchers are doing right now. And the highest complexity occurs when we need to correctly predict the other race cars trajectory, right? The current offline trained algorithms are not considering individual driving behavior. And in our case, what we said what we need is to fit or like basically to overfit to one particular car behavior, right? So just think about you're driving on the racetrack and you're driving against Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel and Fernando Alonso in front of you. So these are three Formula One world champions and all of them are very good drivers, but all of them drive differently. So they have a different type of braking, they have a different type of driving into a turn, and they have a different type of defending their position. That's just their driving style. So on the left side, you can see our solution to this problem by presenting an algorithm for vehicle trajectory prediction that is using some online learning. So the fundament here is a neural network encoder decoder architecture, which is trained offline and predicts the trajectory. So what is new is that the algorithm uses specific vehicle observation during inference to optimize the underlying offline trained neural network at runtime. And on the right side, you can see here um, a short video where we applied that on a street scenario and where you can see that we are now basically overfitting to these individual vehicles and and can detect a five vehicle trajectories at the same time but with this online learning and overfitting we can reduce the uncertainty of the unknown what the vehicle is doing in the future this type um we experimented with a variety of prediction algorithms and i think there is um, no um no wrong prediction algorithm because what you need to figure out is where the other car might going. So at least you have something, then um, you can more, I would say, say constraint, do some constraint overtaking maneuvers. But in the end, um, it comes down how accurate you can do that and how far into the future, because this determines your next move on the racetrack. So now we have done basically everything we need uh, to to figure out standard uh, the standards we need to figure out like where is our car where are the other objects and where are these objects going into the future so now we're coming into the planning part which is for me the heart of an autonomous race car because um the main um behavior of the car like how fast it is and how good it can overtake, and if it can do an overtake maneuver, happens exactly here. Of course, as I said in the beginning, if your localization is not good, you will probably crash into the wall. But the localization itself does not determine if you overtake another vehicle and if you are super fast on the racetrack. This is done only in the planning and later in the control uh, section. So, what we did over the last five years is that we split the planning into two parts. The first one is called global planning, and the second one is local planning for us. In the global planning on the left side, we are just using the racetrack as a static environment. No other vehicles are on the racetrack, no moving vehicles are on the racetrack. We use that racetrack and plan one trajectory, path and velocity profile around this racetrack, and do this offline so we can do this beforehand and this is also something um which we can do because on the racetrack we have some testing time we can go there beforehand we have the possibility to check out the racetrack on the right side we are doing the local planning so now we are in this dynamic environment where we want to race we want to follow we want to overtake so we are planning trajectories around our objects, um, around the moving objects, static objects, and do the op opponent motion prediction and plan a safe and fast trajectory at the same time. And everything needs to be done online, which means real-time recalculation. So everything you're doing on the left side can take some time. Everything you're doing on the right side needs to be fast. 
And I will tell you that in the end again. So I had a lot of discussion with other researchers and they tell me, hey, Johannes, this is this cool optimization algorithm. How about you said? And I said, yes, but how fast it is. And then they tell me it's like five hertz. And I say, yeah, but this is probably not working out um, if you want to raise 300 kilometers an hour. So again, we are in research field and it's good that we develop these kind of algorithms, but on the right side, we need to be fast. So let's first start on the left side, what we are doing in the global planning. In the global planning, we are trying to figure out what is the fastest trajectory around the race train. On the right side, you can three, see three different algorithms um, we applied. The first one is the blue one is called shortest pass optimization, a classical Dijkstra algorithm. Okay, We're trying to run down the shortest pass. So unfortunately, this is not the fastest one, of course. So we developed uh, a second one. You see the orange one. This is called minimum curvature optimization. So you can think about that you, when you're steering the car, you're trying to reduce your steering and just peak in one turn with the steering. So you're increasing and peaking the curvature in one point and then decreasing it again. And this is minimum curvature optimization and you get a lap time of 86 seconds. But the minimum curvature is not the overall fastest. We need a minimum time optimization. Um, in research, it's also called an optimal control problem. So we are running this minimum time optimization algorithm offline beforehand to create the fastest trajectory. Um, this algorithm is a nonlinear problem optimization where we use a double track vehicle dynamic model that can calculate. Um, the wheel load transfer to left and to the right, to the front axle, to the rear axle, where we can have um, the the um, the pitch of the car, the yaw of the car, like basically every car movement on a very detailed or like a physical detail um, narrowed down. So we have an accurate vehicle performance. Unfortunately, these double track models need a lot of parameters. In our case, we had all these parameters. If you start with something like that and have just a car um, from your colleagues or you found online, you may not have this data. Um, a very particular difference to normal car development is that we are using here our road friction knowledge. This is called a wheel specific mu knowledge, which can be integrated in additional map. So what is that exactly? So when you run on, on uh, when you drive with a car, so your car has a contact, the tire and the road have a contact together. And this creates a so-called friction coefficient. And this friction coefficient, we cannot measure directly. We can only can estimate that friction. But this friction coefficient determines in the end how fast you can drive, like, like how fast you can drive and accelerate and how fast you can drive um, around the turns. So the lateral acceleration and the longitudinal acceleration is heavily determined by this coefficient. So what we try to set up, what you see here on the left side, is a friction estimation um, pipeline where we do an effect-based friction estimation backward looking because only if you drive over something, you can actually measure, measure something. And where we do a forward-looking one, a cost-based friction prediction based on camera data, where we try to use some neural networks and determine the area in front of us and the friction coefficient. We fuse everything together. And in the end, we get a friction map that looks something like this. This friction map, what you see here in red, shows high frictions, uh, friction coefficient of one. It's like normal street asphalt. But you also see like some blue section and some green section with low friction areas. But this is very, 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 very important um, because of two reasons. So the one reason you see here in a small blue box, you see these light green um, touches, which determines the left wheels and the right wheels. So the algorithm, the minimum op time optimization algorithm I explained to you before, has the potential to use this and leverage this mu knowledge and actually plan a path exactly over this low friction area. This is very, very impressive because the left wheels are on the left side and the right wheels are on the right side. And what you see here in this upper uh, corner um, of an uh, um, Y distance at uh, 140, you can think about this is a complete bad area. 
So what you see that this algorithm is planning its path directly alongside this area and is avoiding it completely. But normally, if that is a normal friction area, it will run over it. So it's important to have this mu knowledge and leverage it afterwards in order to plan a safe path and a fast path. But the fast path you create not with the path, mostly with the velocity profile. And this is where this velocity at the, the, the friction coefficient comes into account again. So what I show you now is two different velocities and two different paths on different frictions. So one, we have a constant friction of one. And on the other side, we have a changing friction uh, over the whole racetrack. So what you see here is that we have a later breaking into turn one due to higher friction in this turn. So we can actually hit the brakes much harder and later because we have high friction area. Then in a second turn, you see that we have a nearly identical trajectory like from path and velocity profile. And in the end, in turn number three, you see less braking and a throttle application before turn three because we have a low friction area. So we have to hit the acceleration paddle a little bit um, lighter because otherwise our wheels might spin out. And now you understand why we need this friction because it determines the velocity and path profile of our vehicle on the whole racetrack. So this is something we just applied beforehand. Um, this is something we cannot do online right now, but this is something you need online because due to tire wear and rain and, and rubber that is on the racetrack, the friction coefficient changes, which means you need to adapt your vehicle behavior autonomously, automatically over time to again, be a fast racer and a safe racer in the end. Okay. So now we determined how our global optimal race line looks like. And now we're coming into the, the, the last path of planning, which is our local planning. Of course, when you have multiple agents around you, you're in a non-convex problem environment. And in our case, you have to do, we wanted to have like the trade-off between high quality solution and a global optimum. And to be uh, a safe and fast racer, we need to cover you need to cover the, the whole vehicle dynamics range. So what we did, and I think um, here in that case, you find a variety of algorithms out there and the researchers proposing different algorithms, and all of them have their advantages and a disadvantage. This is the same here. So when you see this solution now, you will say, hey, yeah, there might be some issues. And I say, yes, there are. But in our case, this is a very, very reliable solution that makes our car drive fast. So what we did, we split into a local search and a local optimization. In our case, we are using a sampling-based graph search, which is an efficient implementation. And we can apply some arbitrary cost functions to the race um, usage or the, the race setup. And we do a re-optimization with an MPC algorithm where we can refine the solution up to a centimeter level in the end. And because we use the tube MPC algorithm, we can handle disturbances and uncertainties. So the first one is called a sampling-based graph search. So what we did in RoboRace, and that's the slide here, um, we split everything into an offline and online setup. Again, we can do that because uh, we have the access to the racetrack. So what we do is we create a graph on the whole racetrack. We have in a graph edges and nodes. On the edges, we create our trajectory and the nodes are our possibility to, to uh, connect all these edges together. So we create this graph online and on the right side, you see some animation. You see here the blue dots, these are our nodes and you see the edges are then connected alongside. So when we go online on the car, we only do a search on these edges to plan our path. And then afterwards, we calculate the velocity profile um, to run on these edges with the most acceleration, lateral and longitudinal acceleration. So basically, we are searching for um, uh, a local horizon of up to 200 meters in, on the real and on the big cars. We are searching for the edges that, for in our case, for our cost function we define beforehand, are 
creating the, the least cost in the end. So the cost function is something uh, where the magic happens is something we defined. For example, do not deviate from the race line too much. Do not have um, a lot of curvature, for example, or do not exceed the lateral acceleration of the car. And you can come up with um, your own cost function, of course, and say, hey, I have some more intelligent ideas. I have some more uh, cool race ideas. If we create that in a cost function, the car creates a different um, behavior. And what you see here right in this animation is you have some dots and the dots are the opponent vehicle. And you see in red, we are planning our path. And this graph planner gives us the chance to actually do this overtaking maneuver. This happens right now here, right before the turn. So because our graph contains all the dynamics information and is constrained by the racetrack and even has like some distances um, to the edges, we have a, a safe um, planner that creates a solution for us that is ultimately safe and recursively feasible, and therefore we can rely on it heavily. Now we have our trajectory. This is like the final trajectory we want to drive. And as I said before, we are coming now in the last part, the controller, where we do um, the, the final local reoptimization. We experimented uh, with many controllers, uh, with classical control approaches, like a PI and PD controller for the path tracking and the velocity tracking. Ultimately, we ended up uh, with a tube MPC approach in the India Autonomous Challenge, developed by my colleagues Alexander Wisniewski. I put some research, his research here. If you want to go into the deep, uh, you can check that out. Because he compared um, this tube MPC with classical MPC approaches or an LQR approach, what you see here on the right side. And he said, hi, in the end, what we want to do is cover all the uncertainties and create basically a tube, a constrained tube for us in the future, like it's going into the future, the tube that has our maximum lateral accelerations as a big constraint. So that means whenever we do these control actions, we actually know that the car can handle it. Okay, so the driving tube constrains our lateral acceleration, figures out where we can plan inside and re-optimizes our trajectory. And the second thing here is that with these uh, lateral and longitudinal accelerations you see in this diamond on the right side, we are having a point mass model that uses the combined lateral and longitudinal um, vehicle and tire limits. And therefore, we have just one point mass model. This tube MPC runs at 100 hertz, which is super, super fast for an MPC algorithm. And maybe the other MPCs you have seen using single track or even the double track model, and therefore a little bit slower from their execution time. So in our case, the tube MPC creates this uncertainty tube and gives us the guarantee that the solution will be inside this uncertainty tube. And therefore, we can say we have a can rely on that outcome of the trajectory generation and say, this is finally the trajectory we want to drive on. And this is ultimately the trajectory that is fast for us. In RoboRace, this is just um, a small outlook. We also experimented with some algorithms, uh, some Gaussian process algorithms that learns along the racetrack. So we are driving along the racetrack, we are gathering data and using some scale factors to use in a trajectory uh, planning algorithm that scales, for example, our uh, velocity profile. And this is something was just in our research, but this is something where we learned that we need to adapt the car along the racetrack and learn from the changing uh, vehicle um, uh, behavior in the end. And this comes also back to what I said in the beginning. We need to adapt to the vehicle, uh, changing vehicle parameters all the time. Okay, um, we're now at the end of uh, part two. And I just want to give you my answer to the question, like how do we develop software? Autonomous racing for me is not about perception plan planning control in particular or only because we imply more software functionalities, for example, um, the global optimal race line, the tube MPC, or even this um, prediction algorithm that overfits to a specific car. On a specific and sophisticated level, 
um, that are highly reactive, cover the complete vehicle dynamics and need to run fast. This is my um, answer to the question, how do we develop the software if you wanna go into that field? Um, and I, I say that because we as autonomous race car engineers or researchers, um, we are also in the field of robotics, right? And we have ground vehicles and robotics that, for example, have the same pipeline perception planning control or even the same algorithms, but for example, do not need to be that highly reactive or do not need to cover the vehicle dynamics in particular, but in autonomous racing, we do. And that's my big, big learning for you today. Okay, we're coming now into the last section uh, for this talk. And um, this is uh, covered by the question, how do we improve software for an autonomous race car? Because in the last couple of years, I was working with a lot of um, simulations and um, optimization techniques. And here's just my impression, what worked the best for us. Um, you will not have a vehicle in the beginning. Even if you have one vehicle sitting in front of you, you need to test without the vehicle. And what we learned and what we adapted is something startups using, of course, but also something from the normal Formula One motorsport um, environment. Because what we need to do is to test with a full stack, like an early integration of full stack testing is very, very, very important. Because everything I explained to you today is the whole software pipeline that is interconnected, okay? So again, I just can repeat myself, if your localization is not good, your, the best planner will not help you. And this might be a little bit the slight difference perhaps to normal autonomous driving, where even if right, you're, you, you can have somebody that's working on the localization only, and in the end you have some mm, uh, deliverables and you say, this was uh, the goal, we want to have that um, localization, now deal with it in your planner. But in our case, this is so interconnected that your car will not be able to compete, will not be able to drive fast, will crash into the wall immediately. And this is something you cannot afford in uh, such a competition like the Indie Autonomous Challenge, because then you're not part of the competition anymore and you wasted a lot of money as a researcher. So early integration, full stack testing, very, very important. You need to run continuous integration pipelines in the end, in the, um, um, in the background, with some automated software test and development deployment. This is something you are using, for example, in big companies and startups, of course. We created some semi-automated tuning of the algorithm parameters, especially for overfitting to one racetrack. And this is also a big different to normal autonomous driving car development and have complex simulations that have some adversarial and challenging algorithms and environments from the beginning on. Because you're not in an environment where you have rules and regulations, uh, for example, traffic signs, or where maybe the other car is backing up. So this is a race everybody wants to win. So an adversarial environment is very, very necessary. So what we did, created a software in the loop environment with our, uh, uh, yeah, with our software, um, our simulation. We had a 2D simulation and a 3D simulation, and we're running a parameter optimization in the background with a gradient-free optimization technique, never grad is the toolbox, and we can optimize the model, the car parameters, even the, it, it use various scenarios for that. But in the end, it comes down to overfit to one racetrack. So when you go to one racetrack, you want to be optimized for this one racetrack only, okay? So there might be a race in two weeks, there might be a race in two months, but you do not care about that. You want to be the best car for this racetrack only. And everything I just explained to you makes now a little bit more sense because everything fits exactly to that racetrack. So your car is driving at this racetrack um, as the best race car. So we created this pipeline that runs in the background on the cloud and ultimately gives us a parameter setup an optimized theoretical a good parameter setup so you can drive in a uh, simulation. So this is a video from the Indie Autonomous Challenge. Um, this was the ANSA simulation race. And you see here our car in blue driving against three other, uh, two other cars. And these cars are now driving at around 300 kilometers an hour, of course, in simulation. And you see now that we actually, and I just replay that video a few times, um, that we need 
these kind of 3D, very accurate um, visualizations and simulations. You see here the complete racetrack with the grass, the asphalt, the grandstands. Everything is here to run actually this pipeline, to run the localization pipeline, to run the object detection pipeline, and to improve our planning control. And for example, what you see here in our behavior, our car is not backing off um, in particular, even the other car is moving right um, to the left side of us. This is again what I meant with adversarial environment. So you need to create something challenging for your car to actually see its potential of the algorithms and especially the flaws of the algorithms. Again, everything I show here is the research of five, uh, almost six years. So of course I, I have some experience, but when you start with that, you need to figure out what is the floor of your algorithm right now. When we um, did the, the simulation and testing, for us, it was very, very important to move to the real vehicle very quickly. What you see here in this image is on the left side, a simulation. And on the right side, you see the exact same racetrack, the exact same car, this is the Robo race car, doing the exact same behavior because we can re-simulate the real vehicle behavior. And then, bring the learnings from the real car to the simulation, from the simulation to the real car in a constant loop. Motorsports is about testing. Motorsports is about improving your real car. So even if you have the best simulation, even if you, you have to think about you develop the most advanced algorithm for planning control ever, you need to run it on a real car to define its flaws and refine the software architecture afterwards. And this brings me now to the last section. And I now want to show you some uh, real footage from the Indy Autonomous Challenge. And there you see our car driving for the first time. So what you see here in this video is actually the real car running the software pipeline. And in this video, you see, for example, one of the first overtaking maneuvers we did with our friends um, from Autonomous Tiger Racing. And um, you see that our car, the blue car, is doing here the overtaking maneuver. The other car is staying on the left side. This was, of course, like a, a plant maneuver. This was not an adversarial environment. It was just to create some moving objects. But it was the first time we had two Indy Autonomous Challenge cars on the racetrack. And you see our car is doing the move very smoothly to the outside. But now, for example, doing a very sharp move to the inside it was one of the, the first, like, uh, flaws we figured out it's like hey our uh, cost function of the graph planner is a little bit too aggressive um but this is where you learn the most right and this is where the whole pipeline of perception planning control runs all the time and you see where are the issues so the next video i show you is now from the indian autonomous challenge from uh one of the practice days and you see our car here running 200 kilometers an hour so this is very very fast and um, but now i want you to be uh focused on what the car is doing it's driving into the turn and now you see that the car is spinning out you see that in that video very very slightly but here you see the car is spinning out so what happened in our case is that we had a miscalibrated turbocharger and when the car accelerated the turbocharger kicked in and spun the car out this is something um, we could not anticipate. And this is something that happens all the time. I show you this video for two reasons. First of all, is you see the walls right next to us. We were super lucky that this car is we're not crashing into the vault. And number two, you have a spinning car. And a spinning car is not good at all. But maybe if you're a super experienced race driver you could capture that car already we do not have such algorithms right now but i come to that in the end and finally um that's why you're all here because you want to see some racing this is um the real footage from our last race at cs this year where we raced against polymove the team from italy and this is overtaking maneuvers of fully autonomous race cars all the time so what you see now is that the cars race, they overtake each other, and then we increase the speed. And then we overtake each other again. And we do that until we reach um, a point where no car can overtake anymore or where some car is losing. And this is quite impressive because the um, banking in Las Vegas at the racetrack, where you see here, is quite steep. 
And you see that both cars have this very, very good performance of overtaking maneuvers, right? Both cars and our competitors from Polymove did a very, very good job here. Do some very smooth overtaking maneuvers um, coming from the outside, going to the inside. And even if the maneuver is a little bit sharp, the car is stable. And the last overtaking maneuver we see from Polymove is at 270 kilometers an hour. This is super fast. This is the fast as the car can drive. And now you need to be careful what our car is doing <laughs> because our car is spinning out now, unfortunately, because we had a missed detection in the end of the object detection and thought we need to do an overtake maneuver, but that's just motorsport. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. This brings me to the end um, of my talk with um, the, the last um, answer. How do we improve software? Autonomous racing implies high fidelity simulations and an overfitting to individual racetrack. This is a little bit different to normal autonomous driving development. And software evaluation on real hardware is mandatory. You do not win only from simulation. You need to race on the real racetrack to gather the data and the information. I give you one last slide. Um, this is my open challenges. Um, just a short summary. There are many more open challenges, but if you want to work in this field, for me personally, the vehicle dynamics knowledge to create vehicle dynamics that are running on real time, running faster than before and estimating everything the vehicle does, especially the road friction is something we know a lot about, but we have not solved quite uh, roughly. So we have real-time uh, vehicle dynamics knowledge, especially when the tire wear is setting in, when the vehicle mass is changing, so something for the future. Number three is controlling at and beyond the limits. We know a lot about controls, but if we go beyond the limits, and it's what you see here again, the car is slightly drifting to catch the car again autonomously, or even when our car spun out, something like that, we only have seen in drifting research so far, but combining stabilized and unstable vehicle to achieve to catch such a drifting car again it's very interesting real-time capable code yes everybody knows we need that but again if you come up with an idea of a super fancy new algorithm but it's slow then it's probably not for a race car the sim to real gap is still there and finally working with real hardware very pity sometimes it's a lot of work but ultimately um, it rewards you and this brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for the attention. I hope you get a good idea of what autonomous racing is. And I'm looking forward to all of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johannes, for, for the great talk and for the, the good introduction also to the topic. Of course. Uh, let's open the stage for questions. Uh, you can either uh, uh, raise your hand and I will call you or uh, you, you can type in the chat and I will... Uh, I will repeat the question. Maybe I, I will. Uh, I will break the ice. Uh, I actually, it's fortunate because I I was at an event this morning and I saw a talk from Sergio Savaresi, who's also yeah. is the guy you work with or you you know for sure is in the area. Who competed uh, against us? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so, okay. On one end, it's clear that you are doing all of this to push the boundaries to to search for for better algorithms and procedures at the extreme cases. But also wanted to kind of ask you for your vision for where this uh, will will be applied in entertainment. So, so this morning, Sergio was talking about, you know, there's going to be many combinations, right? You, yeah. you will have a, a racing between a human car and a, a autonomous car, but also you will race against your, your best, better self in a simulation. Yeah. So there are a lot of, of combinations. Where do you see this co going in the next uh, future? Yeah, so for me, uh, the, my personal future is competing against the human race driver because this is something we, we always did in AI and technology development. And I just give you two examples. This is um, uh, Watson, IBM Watson doing a Jeopardy. And um, the other one is Deep Blue uh, against Gary Kasparov, the, the chess computer, right? So we always had technologies competing against the human. So what I would love to see is uh, an autonomous race car competing against the Formula One champion to actually figure out who is the best. So there's something uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, 
if you see these cars driving and they drive they drive exactly how programmed <laughs> it's very very boring if you see them go uh, a lot around the track all the time because there is no um yeah stupid individual changes we humans do and and therefore i think the future is not autonomous race cars against autonomous race cars because that will definitely be boring and so my future is um uh, humans against ro against robots into the future okay very cool uh thank you all right let's see we have some questions uh, i will give you the word to, first to otto lappi mm -hmm. okay hi uh thank you for a Thank you for a very cool and uh, exciting presentation, Johannes. So uh, as, a, as a cognitive scientist, I'm, of course, very interested in this human versus versus machine thing. My I, I, my question, though, is is maybe a bit more technical, uh, but comes from the point of view that I think of it from the point of view, how, how a human human being uh, perceives and controls uh, vehicles. So. You said that you did the the, the uh, perception localization from from lidar camera GPS and IMU. So, uh, did, do you not use any uh, telemetry like RPM or steering wheel angle or even brake line pressures mm -hmm. or or, uh, or like uh, spring loads, which 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 might give additional information? And then the, on the actuator side, so how do you actually control say the Indy Lights Dallara? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the first question is, yes, of course, the IMU data, um, fusing IMU and GPS data is, is, is one thing. You get some wheel speed information additional, like some vehicle data inside. Um, the RPM, the, the own speed, the own acceleration, uh, the wheel speed information is also used for the, for the localization, of course, to make it better. Not brake lights, for example, there's something you cannot use um but wheel speed information is also used uh second question is you're sending out a force command to the car right in the end you're calculating the force for the acceleration you're calculating the force for the brakes and this is something that is sent out to the low level ecu and is then translated in an acceleration um either positive or negative and then created brake or um, um an acceleration command Thanks. You're welcome. Great. So uh, the next one up is Aditya Merotra. I hope I spelled it. Yeah, right. pretty great. <laughs> good. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Hi. Uh, I Thank actually you. have a couple of questions. Uh, first Go one ahead. I am not able to wrap around my head about, about the concept of simulation and loop. Uh, could you explain it briefly how, what that is? Yeah. So you can think about um, you're running your 2D, 3D simulation, right? And you're connecting um, an CI continuous integration pipeline. So this pipeline is calling the simulation in the background mm -hmm. with a set of parameters and then starting the simulation, running a simulation to the end. Of course, not showing any visualization because you do not need it running a simulation to the end and then creating a predefined checklist creating a predefined report and just saying hey in that simulation with that parameter setup you created these results for example a lap time for example maximum acceleration for example did i crash into another vehicle and then it's starting the simulation again and again and again and again and when you wake up on the next day you get like a report and saying okay in 200 scenarios i could simulate i failed in like 30 for some reason and then you look at the report and you do that again this okay. is how the software in the loop um simulation looks like mm -hmm. and how, is that uh, similar to hardware in the loop in some way uh, how exactly does that work then yeah yeah so hardware in the loop actually implies that you use some real hardware from the vehicle in this in this loop right mm -hmm. in our case we do not use this hardware at all for example the computation hardware you have in the car we do not use in the software in the loop simulation environment but this is fine because in the software in the loop environment you mainly try to achieve some parameter optimization to get a first real setup 
mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. of the car, like to, 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 to figure out what is wrong with the algorithms, why is it wrong, and do I get a parameter set up to actually drive on a racetrack when you go there for the first time. Mm-hmm. Okay, got it. Uh, then coming to uh, model predictive control, uh, I know there, there are different flavors of MPC that are used based on applications. Is there a particular one that uh, you go for in this application of auto, autonomous racing? Yeah, the one I just explained to you is the, the tube MPC. Um, that's 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 our um, that's like a um, if you Google tube MPC or re- a search for tube MPC, you find many research that covers that. Because it's a, again, it's the special flavor of MPC because you have this uncertainty tube that is created along the way, and you're optimizing inside that tube. Mm-hmm. And the um, the big dynamics we are using here is the point mass model. So the most MPC algorithms you find out there using the single track vehicle model mm-hmm. um, as an underlying uh, vehicle dynamics model, mm-hmm. and. Again, for us, it's just a re-optimization of the trajectory, but the trajectory is created for us one level higher, and we just re-optimize and say, hey, these are the control actions that stabilize the car. Okay, okay. And a little off topic, uh, is there like a favor that you know uh, for highway, autonomous driving on, on a highway scenario? I have not. <laughs> I have not, to be to be fair. I because that's not a topic I I normally deal with. Mm-hmm. But on the on the highway, um, you can apply the same algorithms, right? It doesn't matter. And I would rather use something very sophisticated that is like stripped down a little bit, but mm-hmm. covers, for example, the whole vehicle dynamics, and mm-hmm. um, covers uh, uh, recursive feasible behavior. For example, there's a, one algorithm is called the lane switcher, right? Where you just mm-hmm. switch from one lane to left. Right. So this is something I would not recommend because it it's not the most reliable one. And especially from a physics point of view that you do not cover the vehicle dynamics so roughly because there might happen some situations like um, an evasive maneuver. You have to do right? some somebody's breaking in front of you. So right. I would always go with these more advanced algorithm and strip them down because if you know that they work at 300 kilometers an hour it's easier to also make them work at 150 kilometers an hour mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i see this is my personal recommendation right thanks a lot yeah of course you're welcome uh, great we also have a question from luca Sander. go ahead hi luca Hello, uh, Johannes. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, it was brilliant. Um, I have uh, one question that connects um, slightly. I mean, that connects with the one that Joelle asked, in which you were saying that you expect one day to see um, autonomous vehicles racing against uh, real drivers. And mm-hmm. you may, you've given the example of uh, chess machines that we know nowadays are able to beat um very uh good chess players we read about scandals about people cheating <laughs> in uh, chess events using these yeah. machines and so i was wondering do you think that one day we'll be able to reach the same um but with um uh, autonomous vehicles racing against uh, real drivers so that an autonomous vehicle will eventually be able to be a real driver and if so how far away are we from this happening when, like yeah. when do you see this happening yeah yeah so short answer first yes i believe that and that's just from the from the um my general thinking of how we engineers uh, perceive the world and and work with the world right if i just look back uh the last 60 years 50 years the kind of technology improvements we made this is just the next step okay so this is the next step it will happen and and will happen for sure the second question is more interesting because I saw that we are not quite like we compared real our data, our autonomously race data with the one of a real race driver. Was it um, Formula 2 race driver? We used the Robo race vehicle, both sit in the car, the autonomous software and the real race driver, and we compared the data afterwards. So from only looking at this data, so first of all, the race driver was faster, but then looking at the data. 
and he figured out some spot on the racetrack with um, like two meters per second squared higher acceleration than our car. So everything I explained the last hour to you is just the engineer's perspective on theoretical optimization, a theoretical limit, okay? So we think, oh, this is the limit. The car can drive that. So this guy figured it out. He can drive faster in that exact turn. And then we're like, why Why can you drive faster there? And he's like, yeah, you can feel it. It's like, okay, <laughs> how can I translate that I can feel it? And this is what you hear from a lot of race drivers, right? When you look Formula One, you hear race drivers saying, I feel my tires wearing down. And the engineer says, the tires are looking good. So this is the difference, okay? And this gap we have to close to actually beat him. And I think this takes a little bit more um, AI. I just say AI as a general, but like learning-based approaches integration that figure out how stable is the vehicle in one moment and how faster can I go now, even beyond the limit and then stabilize the car. So I think we are uh, a little bit away from that. Um, to solve that but this is a real world experience I had and that's where I saw hey there is a big gap to the human race driver still yeah so to connect to that question if I may um, then course, how yeah. how many more variables do you think you still have to model and you still have to get to grips with before you actually have a complete model of the vehicle of the race mm -hmm. car of the racing vehicle because you, you mentioned that, tire wear yeah. You mentioned yes. um, the race Mass, track. I mean, consumption, yeah, everything. What um, else is there apart from track conditions and? Uh... So we have everything. Everything is okay. there. But it needs to. It needs to be. That's very very simple. It needs to be translated in two values: the lateral, uh, sorry, the longitudinal and the lateral acceleration. Okay. okay? So these yeah. are the two values and. Right now, we translate them, for example, into a 10 and a 15, okay? But the real value in this turn is a 10.5 and a 14.5. So I here, I'm too much, and here, I'm too less. So in that case, I did not figure out that this was the exact real value. And that's that's the point, okay? So we know how to translate that. We know how to deal with that. But... In that moment, it was a little bit too much and a little bit too less. So the question is, how accurate do I get there? That's the question. I understand. Thanks a lot for your answers. Of course, yeah. You're welcome. Great. Now, probably this is a question from Ale, Alessandro. Hi, Johannes. Hi. Can you hear me? Thank you very yes, much for giving the talk. Very interesting. Um, I had two questions. Uh, one is related to the part where you were talking about the local trajectory controller. Yeah. And you mentioned quickly something about recursive feasibility and the fact that it, you know, you have uh, guarantees that it stays safe. Um, I, I was wondering if you can elaborate a bit more on that because, or at least, you know, what are the assumptions on others' behavior that you do to to, say, to be able to say something like that, right? Because th yeah. there's so, always the eventuality that if you're overtaking someone, he can just swerve into you. Uh, so yes. I was wondering yeah. what kind of uh, assumptions you make on others and how do you handle this kind of uh, you know potential risk? Yeah, yeah. So you remember that we're creating a graph, right? We are creating mm -hmm. a graph along the whole racetrack that is covered with edges and nodes. So when we do the prediction of the other race car and we just make a simple assumption, the other car is driving straight, right? Okay, we are here, the other car is here and the other car is just driving straight. So we are making the assumption that everything here in front of the other car are edges and nodes that I cannot use. They are gone. They are like not usable for us. So the only thing I can do is search a path here on the side and some specific horizon into the future that's the basic assumption we are doing so we are getting rid of all the nodes and edges we are calculated from the prediction beforehand and that's okay, where I we say, can say like hey 
we think the other car is doing uh, in the next five seconds, 10 seconds, is, is just driving straight. We're not looking at these kind of nodes at all. So then we are okay, planning so the trajectory around that and then would move into the, into the left side in like in 10 seconds, something like that. Okay. And you don't, you don't consider like a potential you know, blocking maneuvers or things like that? We the did. We do that. that. Yeah. We do that. We do that too, too, of course. But this is then in our pipeline when we think, hey, we see now the other car is doing like a swerving maneuver to the right side. We would calculate that in our prediction and integrate that in our um, in our local planning. Of course, if okay. we have like a blocking maneuver that happens like this, okay, then mm -hmm. we are having like an emergency trajectory with an evasive maneuver as a last resort. But since we are also covering the, the accelerations and calculation, calculate the acceleration in our graph, we can actually know one when the limit is reached to not break at all. So even if the other cost works to us, we can break down beforehand. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Thank you. Um, of course. The other question is it's totally unrelated. So at a certain point, uh, you were showing the simulator that you were using for the, the Indian Indi Autonomous Car and mm -hmm. yeah, the Indy Challenge. I was wondering, like, was it also simulating the sensors? Like the, the, yes. the, yeah, the yeah, LiDAR yeah. and so? Yeah, yeah. What, that uh, was written which... to us and with everything. Okay. Sorry. I was wondering at which degree of uh, fidelity was it simulating the, for example, the LiDAR? Let's say, was it simulating really like to the point where you have the single packets coming as the LiDAR spins? Or it's you just get the point cloud one the once the let's say the the full rotation of the lidar. Uh, yeah, the ladder the ladder one. We were giving a point okay. cloud from the environment. Yes. Okay, but it still simulates also the distortions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had that. Okay, we had that too. Okay. So the cool. the lidar simulation or like um, sensor simulation is a little bit difficult because. We had the simulator, and then afterwards we moved to an own simulator, and then we did some own development, and we got it to a level where we were quite happy with the real world and simulation experiments, and said, "Hey, this is fine enough, and uh, we think it's a it's a good match, but probably you could improve it ten x more." Hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I know it's a hard topic. That's why I was asking. No, of course, yeah, Thank you. yeah. That's that, that one of the most questions. Like, how did you simulate sensors, right? How did you do that? Of course. All right, great. I think uh, we can let Johannes go to the rest of the challenges for the day, probably. Uh, thank you again very much, Johannes. It was very cool to to have a glimpse of this field, and also good luck for your next steps, uh, especially now that you're starting your own lab, working on these challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I think we probably see each other, hopefully in real life uh, in the next yes. uh, weeks or months. I probably visit uh, Zurich one day. Um, looking forward to see your research. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Looking Thanks, forward everybody. to it. Thank you and take see care. You. Bye. 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 Ciao. Ciao.